Good afternoon, everyone. You're all very welcome. We're just going to wait for a further minute or two just to allow other people to join uh, the meeting this afternoon. So we'll get started in about a minute or two. So thank you all for, for being here. Look forward to talking with you all very, very soon. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for attending this School of Law Constitutional Conversations Group online event uh, today. You're all very warmly welcome to Virtual Queens for this seminar. Thank you so much for uh, joining us for this discussion. Your participation engagement is greatly appreciated in the conversation. My name is Colin Harvey and I'm going to be chairing the seminar today, but I also be contributing as well today as a member of the School of Law, but also as a member of, of the group. The theme for our discussion this afternoon is a new constitution for a new Ireland. And there's a question mark there. Uh, the event is being uh, recorded today. In terms of the Constitutional Conversations Group, we are an informal group of individuals working in a strictly personal capacity only to promote dialogue and debate about constitutional change. We are Mark Bassett, John Gormley, Paddy Kelly and Eilish Rooney and myself, and we've held several meetings in Derry, Belfast, uh, Dublin, and produced a number of accessible papers and cards as well to inform and shape the debate that you're all very aware is taking place right now. Ultimately, what we're trying to do is focus on creating a space for conversation and dialogue. A question mark in the title today is deliberate. Just to check in that you can hear me today, okay? I can hear. OK, the question mark in the title is deliberate. You'll be aware of a growing uh, discussion around constitutional change, particularly OK, got that post Brexit about how this island is shared now and how it is best shared in the future. You'll all be aware this afternoon that there are many academic initiatives widening civic engagement. There's work by political parties. Uh, work by individuals and many will have noted for example reports from the Ireland's Future event at the weekend and publications by that organization such as a recent publication rights citizenship and identity in the United Ireland. The focus today is on constitutional change and related questions. The premise for the conversation which you can of course in discussion with us today contest is that the island is heading towards concurrent referendums. Our view remains that these referendums will be concurrent, but we realize that that is a subject of ongoing debate. It raises questions about what is going to be proposed and how the plans are going to be developed before these referendums take place and afterwards as well. As you all know this afternoon, any constitutional question like this 
there will be matters of both process and substance to think about. So to those of you perhaps this afternoon who might say to us, why not present your blueprint to this discussion today and now? I think our response would be that there are valid questions about how this is legitimately generated, how the conversation about constitutional change is legitimately generated. Thus, you will have all noted proposals that have been made around an all island citizens assembly, or in fact, even more than one citizens assembly with a strong focus on civic dialogue. You will have heard people talk about creating a minister with responsibility in this specific area, the establishment of an Oireachtas committee to explore it in more detail and many other proposals that are out there now. So the discussion today is going to focus on matters of both process and substance. The format that we've selected uh, for you in this discussion, but uh, you're obviously welcome to, to join in, is that each speaker is going to briefly present on a selected uh, topic. And we've agreed with each other to try and be relatively rigorous with each other around five or so minutes on each theme. We're going to hear about constitutional options. We're going to hear about human rights and equality considerations, questions around gender equality in particular, and issues around healthcare and health systems. Those are the issues and subjects that we've selected under the topic today, but I'm conscious that you will have many more points and reflections and comments to make beyond that too. We're, we're conscious in this discussion that we are in the beginnings of a conversation about all of this in which people are uh, warmly welcome to participate. So after the speakers have finished uh, their contributions, I'm going to invite reflections, comments, insights from the audience. If you want to do that, uh, you can do that in the chat function or you can raise your hand afterwards as well. I'll do my very best to, to identify people who want to make a comment or even just want to make a reflection in the chat, we can note those too. Bearing in mind, of course, before we get into each of the speakers, that these are all relatively open questions framed, of course, by the Belfast Good Friday Agreement, but they're all questions on which reasonable disagreement, even among people who share a common objective, reasonable disagreement is possible and does exist. So you'll be glad to hear that's enough from me uh, by way of introduction today. And I'm going to hand you over to my colleague, uh, Mark Bassett, who's going to talk us through some of the constitutional options. And thank you all again for being with us this afternoon, Mark. Hey, Dan. Uh, thanks, Colin, and, and thanks, Declan, for setting this up. And just like to say thanks to everybody uh, who's come along. I'm very grateful for this opportunity to discuss uh, this subject. Uh, as Colin has said, we, we think that a, a concurrent referendums are on the horizon. And the electorates on this island are going to be asked whether together they favour Irish reunification or continuation of the status quo. And we think that the offers given to those electorates have to be set out in clear terms and they have to be consistent with uh, the promises made in the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, much of the preparation still has to be done and there's a particular responsibility we think on the, the Irish government in particular to set out uh, what is possible and what, what's, what's going to be offered. Uh, here in Northern Ireland we don't know the exact question that's going to be posed uh, but we think it's going to be something along the lines of option A for the union between Northern Ireland and Britain uh, or in the United Kingdom or option B for unity. So option A means a continuation of the current constitutional arrangements. And Northern Ireland is a part of the United Kingdom. There's a hereditary monarchy. There's a par parliamentary sovereignty in Westminster, uh, which includes a House of Commons to which uh, Northern Ireland contributes 18 of the 650 MEPs. Uh, there's a House of Lords, which contains hereditary peers, and if we read the papers, uh, political donors out of a population of almost 800. Uh, there's devolution on the terms of the Northern Ireland Act, although there's an apparent preference uh, in the current UK government for that to, to possibly go into, into reverse. Uh, we have an assembly, we have an executive uh, based on power sharing principles. There are north-south bodies and Northern Ireland is out of the European Union, uh, but it's in the protocol and it's likely to stay in some sort of protocol. 
and we have the current citizenship provisions and we have some important human rights protections. Uh, but we think that that constitutional arrangement very often prevents Northern Ireland from having an effective influence on UK policy in some significant matters. Uh, that's seen most notably in Brexit and the protocol, but it's also there in the hostile environment immigration system. Uh, there's a proposed troubles amnesty on the horizon. There's possible reform to access to the courts through judicial review. And uh, there is proposals for the, the abolition or at least the reform uh, of the Human Rights Act. Uh, so it looks like uh, one of the options is going to be more of the same. So it's, it's a conser conservative government for the foreseeable future, and it's committed to centralization and greater power to uh, executive government. Uh, the other option, option B, that's going to be presented to voters in Northern Ireland will be departure. Uh, Northern Ireland will come out of the United Kingdom and will become part of a reunited state uh, of Ireland. And the terms of that should be in accordance with the Good Friday Agreement and consistent with uh, the procedure which is in, currently set out in the Northern Ireland Act. And there's a, as you know, there's a promise in the Good Friday Agreement for faithful implementation of that uh, outcome by uh, Westminster Parliament. In the South, uh, the electorate is also going to be asked to vote in favour of reunification. Uh, and it seems uh, to me that there's going to have to be some significant changes to the current text of the Constitution at a minimum. And uh, that's going to have to be a new two and three. Uh, but it's likely, I think, to, be able to mean a lot more than that. Uh, there's some discussion and some support on the question of ent an entirely new document, a new Constitution. Uh, but whatever is going to be proposed uh, is going to have to be uh, transformative. Uh, it's going to have to keep together the majority for reunification in the Republic that, that seems to be there. Uh, but it's also going to have to contribute to convincing a sufficient number of non-aligned voters in the North to back unity. Uh, it's going to have to allow for implementation of unification, which is consistent with the Good Friday Agreement. So what we're going to have is concurrent referendums and there's going to be different questions posed in each jurisdiction and they're going to have different uh, immediate legal effects. But the idea is to come to the same outcome. What's for the future? Is it partition or is it reunification? In thinking about how that, what can be done in the, in the vote in the South in kind of technical terms, I think reunification is going to have to be achieved by a a single affirmative response to a question. So it's going to be some sort of proposal uh, put to the electorate there. Uh, I don't think that there can be multiple questions posed which could lead to incompatible results. Uh, if it's a new constitution or a number of approved changes, it may be that they may have to be held in abeyance, uh, waiting the, the results in Northern Ireland, or there'll be some sort of transitional elements to it as occurred after the, the votes in 1998. Uh, I think it's also important that it may be that the changes that are approved by the electorate in the Republic at that time uh, will have to be given some sort of higher constitutional status. Uh, and this occurred with uh, Irish Ireland becoming a member of the, the European communities uh, prior to 1972. Uh, it should also be that whatever changes or, or new constitution are consistent with the campaign uh, and, and the promises that are made to the, the electorate in the north. Uh, but the, the question of exactly what changes uh, is, is still open. I mean, there is at least a plausible option uh, of, a, of a kind of a bare reunification along the German lines. And, and you know, that's one that you know, has been variously described as absorption or assimilate, assimilation. Uh, don't favour that. It's going to have to be a substantially different constitutional arrangement for, for what is going to be a substantially different state. It's going to have to be am ambitious if it's hoping to secure a majority in, in both jurisdictions. Uh, and whatever is proposed, the, uh, the hope is that a future Irish government uh, with support in, in civil society and wide support in the Oireachtas is going to have to offer a new type of country. It's going to be one of partnership between North and South within the one state. It's going to have to be consistent with the promises on rights protection, parity of esteem, equal citizenship, uh, which are contained in uh, 
the Good Friday Agreement, and uh, it's going to be a member state of the European Union. Now, if even a couple of years ago would have uh, anticipated that the, that the proposal uh, from uh, Irish governments then would have been pretty conservative, but and that was based on was a pretty uh, conservative and slow response to some uh, modest constitutional changes. You know, the best example being the extension of the franchise for the presidential voting. But I'm much more optimistic now. That, you know, the, the debate has accelerated and, and it's deepened. And uh, it's not just the symbols of the Republic that are being discussed. Uh, we've had some very helpful proposals from uh, Jim O'Callaghan in Fianna Fáil and from Neil Richmond in, in Fine Gael, and they are much more ambitious than we would have anticipated only a couple of years ago. Now, you can speculate that they are possibly or probably the position of, of those two large parties, maybe not the current Taoiseach, but the, you know, that is the thinking in, in, in those parties. That it's likely that they, that they have been considered and supported mm -hmm. by, by the colleagues. Uh, there's also uh, the other biggest party in the state, Sinn Féin, is, is obviously in, in favour and has shown uh, ambition on, on the type of New Ireland that, that, that could be proposed. Yeah, so if, and the, the other thing to keep in mind is that there's been some very able work done by uh, Richard Humphreys in, in his books on, on the kind of changes that should, that should and, and could be done uh, either before, after or, or during a, a referendum campaign. So what I've tried to do is to try and detect a, a common ground between those parties and, and the Good Friday Agreement, and you know what is likely to be a, an ambitious but realistic proposal. And uh, my own view, for for what it's worth, is it's more likely to be substantial changes to a, a a number of aspects of the current constitution rather than a than a completely new document. So that's not certain, but it's it's offered as an educated guess. Uh, what's proposed is going to have to accommodate the interlocking sets of principles and structures and institutions which are in the agreement. So much of the symbolism we think in the South is going to have to be updated to uh, accommodate a promise of parity of esteem. That's perhaps the preamble in the Constitution, a national flag in Article 7, perhaps the national anthem, uh, the higher status that's currently afforded to the Irish language in, in Article 8. Uh, but exactly how that's going to be done uh, is, is still open for uh, debate. Uh, the present devolved institutions in the North uh, will also have to be given some sort of constitutional recognition. Uh, the Good Friday Agreement promise was for local power sharing and unless and until something else is agreed. Uh, that should be continue to be operable in the United Ireland. Uh, their existence uh, here, I, th I think, is, is, is held in very high esteem, not always the, the particular performance, but the idea of, of local institutions uh, is important. And unless something else is proposed, uh, it seems to me that our Article 15 in the, in the Constitution is going to have to be revised. Uh, there's going to be some sort of continuation of the legal jurisdiction and existing laws of Northern Ireland, although they continue to be perhaps subject to uh, the Constitution. Uh, the Constitution's uh, sometimes emphasis on Irish citizenship uh, is going to have to be revisited and expanded at a minimum to include uh, British citizens resident in the United Ireland. Uh, but it should be th this opportunity should be taken to for to make it much more ambitious and uh, to uh, accommodate in, in, a, in a more generous way uh, all the residents of the United Ireland. Uh, another matter which may require some consideration is whether Ireland can, can and should uh, seek some provision in EU law for the status of British citizens resident in the United Ireland. And it seems to me that this could be perhaps best or most efficiently achieved by the insertion of the, the Good Friday Agreement into the, into the Constitution and, and given a, a status which ensures that uh, the character of the, of the United Ireland state uh, reflects those promises that have been made. And so that, in effect, is preserving the kind of current contours of the Constitution, but it's changing the character in a, in a number of uh, important ways for the better. Uh, so there'll be some things that will say largely the same. You know, there'll be an Oireachtas in Dublin as the primary lawmaker. 
that is, it should be an elected or expectations that the elected Irish president will continue. There'll be independent courts with the Irish Supreme Court at the apex, the judicial review of legislation, fundamental rights in the constitution. Uh, Ireland is going to be a full member of the European Union uh, and it's going to be in the Eurozone. And the East-West cooperation as provided for in the uh, Good Friday Agreement can be updated and can continue uh, as promised in the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, and that constitution, it, it's the legal architecture which allows people you know, to, to mediate disputes, work together uh, and make the most uh, of the opportunities that are presented. But a constitution is never enough on its own. Uh, it's how the people of a United Ireland come together and work together on employment uh, that's going to make, uh, that's going to offer the best future for everyone. Thanks, yeah. Con. I hope I haven't gone over. You have gone over, but we're, <laughs> <laughs> but we're fine. A lot of ideas there being floated around um, the present and future options as well. Just remind participants uh, to please use the chat box function there as well and uh, make use of that, put questions and reflections in there. We're now over to Patty Kelly, who's going to talk about human rights and equality. Patty. I think I've unmuted myself. Can you hear me okay? Yep, we can hear you. Okay, that, that's great. Thank you. Thank you, Colin. Can I apologize in advance? I, I have developed overnight a cough, so I hope I don't uh, have a coffin fit in the middle of it if uh, and if I do please please bear with me um, uh, what I'm going to focus on is is human rights and equality um, society suffers when the universality of rights is demeaned and that's what Alison Kilpatrick the new chief commissioner in the human rights commission said recently for me it has a resonance for what has happened since the signing of the good friday agreement and especially in recent years human rights have been demeaned society is suffering and individuals are suffering because they can't vindicate their right, their rights, their right to education, their right to housing, their right to health services. The rights protections in the Good Friday Agreement are there because our conflict was rooted in a denial of rights. The rights protections which were hard fought for, they were there to ensure the protection and vindication of human rights for all and they were there to ensure the peace. There was huge potential in the agreement to build a society where protections with protections for rights for all. It provided for the incorporation of the ECHR, making it justiciable in domestic courts, bringing rights home. The potential of a strong enforceable Bill of Rights, a safeguard for countries emerging from conflict, a Bill of Rights which would strengthen and add to the rights protections in the ECHR, with the potential for strong enforceable protections of socioeconomic rights, strong equality protections for everyone, regardless of their gender, religion, ethnic origin, age, ability, disability. A Bill of Rights that would ensure a child with mental health needs, whether they're from the Shankle or the Falls, would be able to access services even if their parents couldn't afford to pay. The agreement held out the potential of an all-island charter of rights, which had the potential to ensure equivalency of rights protections on the island, growing protections in both jurisdictions. The agreement promised equality of opportunity for those living in this jurisdiction, requiring duty bearers to consider the impact of their policies on protected categories and mitigating for adverse impacts. It held out the promise of a Department of Equality. It promised strong human rights institutions in both jurisdictions to promote and monitor human rights protections and to advise government. It promised Irish language rights. Rights are woven throughout the agreement but almost before the ink was dry, there was a concerted and sustained move on the part of the British government to obstruct and hollow out those protections and promised rights. And irregardless of the potential threat to peace. Despite a recent poll showing 83% of people here believing that the right to an adequate standard of physical and mental health should be protected in the Bill of Rights, 88% believing a right to education should be protected 84% believing a right to adequate housing should be protected and 75% supporting enforceability of rights in the Bill of Rights. The British government continues to breach its com commitments in the Good Friday Agreement, continues to ignore the advice of the Human Rights Commission it established and refuses to pe provide people here with human rights prote protections. They overwhelmingly want and importantly, as COVID has demonstrated, desperately need. 
It's 10 years since the respective commissions have looked at the Charter of Rights. One can only speculate as to what, what a safety net the Charter and the Bill of Rights might have provided in the time of COVID and to the inevitable diminution of rights in this jurisdiction as a result of Brexit. The failure of the equality of opportunity provisions of the Good Friday Agreement to deliver any change in rights protections has long challenged those who seek to realise the rights potentials of the Good Friday Agreement. The human rights institutions have been starved of resources and have had to fight for powers. And the UK government last week missed yet another of its own deadlines in its ongoing failure to ensure Irish language rights promised in the Good Friday Agreement. The Human Rights Act is clearly in the sights of the British government, with their most recent Justice Minister yet again declaring their attention to scrap the Act, despite it underpinning the rights protections in the Good Friday Agreement and our peace process. The threat to the ability to vindicate rights as a result of the UK government's proposed changes to judicial review would present major challenges to those seeking to make rights real. The recent amnesty proposals are in total breach of the UK government's international human rights obligation. And the British government stands poised to trigger Article 16. And the question is, will their actions present a threat to the rights provisions hard fought for and secured in the protocol, which sought to protect the Good Friday Agreement in all its parts? Despite the best efforts of very many people to make it work to deliver on the rights protections in the Good Friday Agreement, what is clearly evident 23 years after it signed a binding international agreement is that the British government has not and will not honour its commitment to deliver on rights protections in the Good Friday Agreement. No matter how persuasive the argument, no matter how many of our citizens support the rights protections, irrespective of their international obligations, and regardless of what international pressure can be brought to bear. Rather, as what we have seen, rather as we have seen through the Brexit process, negotiations, the Good Friday Agreement and our rights have become political footballs used and discarded when viewed by them as being potentially expedient. If the British government will not deliver on its commitments made in an international agreement, how do we secure the right of every child to access education and mental health services? The right of every cancer patient to access treatment? How do we secure the right not to be discriminated because of our disability, our age or our sexual orientation? We must turn back to the agreement and find another way to build on its promises of rights protections, including, including those which are future facing. The agreement presents that other way, an opportunity to shape a new society where the rights of all are protected in a new constitution for a new Ireland. What those rights protections look like has to be at the core of the constitutional conversation and any new constitution on this island. They need to include socioeconomic rights, cultured rights, women's rights, children's rights, environmental rights, digital rights, the rights for people with disability. They have to be enjoyed by everyone without discrimination and they need to be enforceable. What those protections look like has to be, in be informed by your lived experience and your expertise. We can't leave it to those who don't know what it feels like to have to fight every day to access critical services or to those who've never had to battle discrimination. Human rights advocates, community activists, trade unions and civil society ensured rights were at the heart of the Good Friday Agreement. As the constitutional conversation develops and grows, we all need to do the same again ensure that rights protections are at the heart of the constitutional conversation and any new conversation in a new Ireland. Thank you. Thank you very, thank much, you very Patty, much, Patty. And thank you, uh, thank Mark and Patty there for some way setting out the, the variety of, of options and Patty's emphasis there on the centrality of human rights to the future conversation too. Just also gonna encourage again, people to use the chat box to add reflections and comments. And for those on social media, if you do want to use a hashtag New Ireland New Constitution, please feel very free to do so. Now I'm going to turn to my colleague Eilish Rooney, who's going to talk to us about constitutional futures and gender equality. Eilish, are you there? Hello. Hello, Colin. Can you hear me OK? Hello. We can hear you. Yeah. Oh, great. Thank you. Great. Um, I've called a few words, I have to say, engendering constitutional conversations. To begin with, I'll reflect on the Good Friday Agreement 
and then some reflections on our experience of constitutional conversations. So when we ask the woman question in the context of constitutional futures on this island, we raise two fundamental matters of women's equality and rights that were addressed in the Good Friday Agreement almost 25 years ago. The first is to do with the absence of women in public and political life. The absence, in other words, of women from positions of power where important decisions are taken that affect us all. The drafters of the agreement saw that an absence of women is unacceptable and should be addressed in the future. They made a commitment in the agreement to the right of women, and I quote, to full and equal political participation and also to the advancement of women in public life. Neither of these commitments carried a way to enforce compliance. They are, if you like, aspirational commitments, but still important for all that. The second aspect, aspect of the woman question dealt with in the agreement is gender equality in the form of gender justice. Gender justice refers to substantive equality in the fair and equal distribution of political, economic, cultural and social, social resources across society. Gender justice has obvious implications for women's safety and security. The agreement contains a commitment to, and I quote, the right to equal opportunity in all social and economic activity, regardless of class, creed, disability, gender or ethnicity. The right to this equal opportunity became a statutory duty, often called the Section 75 duty, and it required all public bodies to promote equality of opportunity across nine grounds, religion, politics, race, age, marital status, sexual orientation, men and women, disability and dependence. The statutory duty is often treated in research on women's inequalities as an intersectional equality duty. In other words, each of the circumstances that are recognised as a source of discrimination and inequality are also gendered. The lives of women and men in each category are impacted or shaped deeply by structural gender inequalities. This is the case, for example, for a person who has a disability, for a person who lives in an economically disadvantaged district and so on. Almost 25 years on, and whilst there are more women in public life, and around 30% of the MLAs are women, the everyday lives of women continue to reflect deep structural inequalities. Low paid and unpaid care work is essentially women's work. Women's work relies on inadequate childcare in a society where disgraceful levels of child poverty persist. The conditions of marginalised women's lives are often invisible when decisions are taken about the redistribution of state resources at Westminster. In all of this, it is necessary to be reminded in constitutional conversations and in the preparations afoot for a referendum that women do not enter the conversation on an equal basis. There is no area of public policy where women and men do not have different experiences of and access to resources, power and safety. For many social justice activists who want to change this setup for the benefit of women in marginalised districts, they see the opportunity provided in constitutional conversations by Brexit, by demographics and by the failure of successive British governments to meet peace agreement commitments. They see these breaches and debacles as an opportunity to imagine a new Ireland within the European Union, as an opportunity not to be missed, and they have grabbed it with both hands. Social justice advocates who see union within the United Kingdom as offering the best prospect for women's equality 
have treated the opportunity to have constitutional conversations also as an opportunity to have a say and to have their say noted. In these circumstances, women with different experiences of the state in Northern Ireland have diverse views about the future. Many are unsure as to the improvements in women's lives that the prospect of constitutional change might hold for both union and unity. Others are downright ambitious and determined that a new Ireland will enshrine the right of the people of the island in all their variousness to the ownership of the island. They view this crisis or possible crisis of constitutional futures as an opportunity. Now, some reflections on constitutional conversation so far. A remarkable feature of the constitutional constitution's experience to date is that from the outset, women have been to the fore as organizers, speakers, researchers, critics and activists. Many of them view the prospect of a new Ireland as an opportunity to put gender justice at the centre of the conversation, whatever the outcome, whether they would vote for union or for unity. They see this time of preparation for a referendum as an opportunity to build on the commitments made to women's rights and gender justice in the agreement. The commitments in the agreement, referred to already, the right of women to full and equal political participation and the advancement of women in public life, as we've said, had neither targets nor timeframes, neither monitoring mechanisms nor legal standing. They were commitments in principle rather than in practice, even though progress has been made. The more substantive commitment to gender equality in the statutory duty was also without benchmarks, without targets to be achieved within a time frame, and the monitoring mechanism has proved to be a weak means of making significant improvements to women's lives. Some women researchers and social justice advocates involved in constitutional conversations have addressed these challenges and the practicalities involved. For instance, in the development of an all island health service, they have researched the justice and redistributive issues at the heart of social welfare on both parts of the island. Others have been involved in thinking about and researching employment, education and the economy. Some legal feminists in the constitutional conversations field have placed their focus on remedying existing injustices and improving the material conditions of women's lives. They recognise the limitations of cost constitutions as a means to remedy structural injustices. Nevertheless, they encourage everyone within and between these islands to be free to see constitutional conversations as an opportunity to imagine a new society where, regardless of gender, everyone has equal access to resources and power, where the environment is in the hands of the people rather than, than the profiteers. I know it is heady stuff, this space. Some women from the women's sector organisations and those working in local groups see constitutional conversations as an opportunity to draw attention to the practical issues they deal with day and daily. The care economy, including poor childcare facilities and low wages, the economic neglect of working class districts, serious long term issues that rarely gain traction in public political debate. They point to the little progress they, progress they have made over many years of lobbying and they ask what difference will a new constitution make to women like us? This is some of what women have done so far when faced with the opportunity to map and imagine the potential of structural and institutional change on the island that could lead to a reallocation of power and responsibility. At a practical level, women involved in constitutional conversations and research have understood the possibility that constitutional change is an opportunity to change the discourse, to create awareness, to make women's lives visible and matter in debates about the future. The prospect of a unity union referendum is seen by many men and women concerned with gender justice as an opportunity 
to strengthen the legal basis of women's equality and security, to redress wrongs, to protect women from gender-based violence, to make visible institutional, institutionalized gender inequality and discrimination that affects women's lives from all backgrounds. They see preparation for a referendum as an opportunity to mainstream gender equality. To adopt an observation made by Scotland's in gender in relation to IndyRef and the prospect of Scottish independence, and I quote, there is no area of governance and policy where women and men do not have different experiences of and access to power, resource and safety. That word difference there is used in the sense of unequal access, unequal experiences of power, resource and safety. For 52% of the population, gender-based inequalities are unacceptable. They are unacceptable for all of us. Indeed, it is fair to say it is deplorable that women continue to require legal protections to recognise their full status as equal human beings in this society. The Constitutional Conversations Group included women in grassroots organisations in the conversation from the outset. Our experience and research shows that gender equality and women's lives you are a mainstream concern of progressive projects involved in the preparations that are necessary and that are underway in universities and other institutions across these islands. There is a lot to be learned from post-conflict and other jurisdictions such as Scotland about mainstreaming gender equality in constitution building. They include the naming of women, mainstreaming gender in the research and making constitutional commitments to a safe future in a new Ireland. One where the children of the island are cherished, where their futures are cared for and where the laughter of their children will in turn be a true legacy of new constitutional futures. Thank you, Colin. Thank you so much, Eilish, for that. And important theme there of the opportunity of these conversations as well and some of the work that's ongoing around that. I'm now going to hand over to colleague John Gormley, who's going to talk on the theme of healthcare. Keep comments coming in the chat box. And I see some people are using the hashtag as well. Uh, new Ireland, new constitution. Please feel free to use that too. Over to you, John. Thank you, Colin, and thanks indeed to everyone involved in today's event. I hope you can hear me well enough. Um, a recent poll carried out here by the University of Liverpool found that health is the most important issue concerning people in the North at the present time, not surprisingly. And looking ahead to a future referendum on Irish unity, I think we can confidently say that those voting in such a referendum or referendums will want to know in advance what an All-Ireland Health Service will look like. If we don't articulate a vision of that service and inform the debate with facts, then we will create the risk that people will be swayed by false arguments and unsubstantiated claims. The UK is a national health service which is free of charge at the point of delivery. The vast bulk of the NHS budget is centrally funded from taxation and national insurance, and many people admire the NHS and the benefits of the NHS are often cited as an argument for staying within the UK. The Republic of Ireland has a two-tier health service. The first tier is the public health care system funded by the state, and the second tier is the private health care system funded primarily through private medical insurance. Even in the public health care system, there are some user charges, but around 35% of the population have a medical card which exempts uh, them from charges for public health services. This two-tier system enables those who can afford it to pay for additional better quality or faster access to healthcare. However, these brief descriptions don't paint a complete picture and can be misleading. Research suggests that service levels across the North and South are broadly comparable across a range of key metrics, but with the South having the better performance in areas including the number of active physicians and the number of hospital beds per thousand of population. However, when compared to other European countries, both North and South have poor population health outcomes. In the UK and here in the North in particular, long NHS waiting lists means the point of delivery never comes or certainly doesn't come soon enough for most people. 
Figures from the Department of Health here show that there are 350,000 people waiting on a first consultative appointment, a 10% increase on the equivalent period last year. 53% of those people have been waiting a year or more. In July this year, the Guardian newspaper reported that a combination of the COVID pandemic and concern about the length of NHS waiting lists is driving a growing number of NHS patients to take out private medical insurance or to pay for private health care. The article claimed that the UK is drifting towards two-tier health care with the wealthy given more chances to skip the queue. The Republic also suffers from long waiting lists with 900,000 people waiting to be treated or assessed by a consultant, an increase of 8% since the, the, this time last year. The Republic has launched Launch Care as an initiative aimed at abolishing the state's two-tier health system, replacing it instead with a universal health care model where treatment would be based on medical need and not on ability to pay. So arguably the South is heading in the right direction, although progress remains slow. So in looking ahead to a referendum on Irish unity and the debate on health, why should the conversation be limited to the two failing systems that already exist on this island? Why not have an ambitious transformative process such as a citizens assembly to discuss the shape of a future All-Ireland Health Service, drawing on the best of what we already have, but also identifying where we need to do what we need to do differently to achieve the vision of a universal single tier health service which genuinely meets the needs of patients, which is adequately resourced and which is funded through general taxation. And in doing so, why not consider inserting into the new constitution of a new Ireland a provision addressing the right to the highest attainable standard of universal, universal health care? Many countries already do this, though not the UK or the Republic, and research has shown that a constitutional right to health is significantly correlated with improvement, with improved well-being among the population. And in the same vein, why not, as Paddy suggested, include within a new Bill of Rights for Ireland the right of citizens to have the highest attainable standard of physical and mental health? I think that those three actions or those three questions that I've posed around a citizens' assembly on health, a constitutional right to health care and inclusion of health within a Bill of Rights would reassure the wider community that the debate on health as part of the bigger debate on the constitutional future of this island is focused on transforming for, for the better the lives of all of the people on this island. Thank you. Thank you very much, John, and thank you to everyone for sketching out a range of perspectives and options in terms of where this conversation is at and where it might go, bearing in mind there are many other topics that we could have concluded today. What I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you a short flavour of some of the themes that are emerging in the chat box. And then I'd ask you in the audience there if you would like to ask a specific question to the panel to, to put your hand up. Uh, I see Aidan's talking about the lessons learned from Brexit and the need for a concrete vision of what a new constitution might look like. Um, James there in the chat function has actually proposed uh, aspects of what looks like a new constitution for people to have a look at and a range of proposals there. Uh, William is talking about the calling of a border poll and the role of the Secretary of State in that and the time frame. Now there's an interesting question for discussion around the role of the British government, the Secretary of State and the time frame for taking all this forward, something the panel might like to reflect on. There's a number of congratulations and well done there as well. Uh, Brexit occurs too. Uh, the issue of inspiration around the constitutional conversation and the opportunities that were raised throughout the, the discussion, and also reference to uh, feminism being threaded through a new constitution, and the issue of uh, environmental protection, uh, point raised there, perhaps the territory and ecosystems themselves should be recognised as rights-bearing subjects 
perhaps I need to be uh, imaginative when we think about uh, Bill of uh, Rights. It's notable looking back actually that the Bill of Rights that the Commission submitted here did include environmental rights in its advice of 2008. So I'm just going to, I've mentioned a few points there. See anybody in the audience out there like to raise your hand, just use the raise hand function there, would like to, to raise a question specifically now before I go back to the panel on some of those. Anybody out there want to put their hand up and ask a question? Okay. Billy, Billy Leonard, you've got your hand up there. Billy, can we hear Billy's question? Can you hear me okay now? Yep, we can hear you. OK, right. Um, a few points and maybe trying to sort of put the question at the end of them. Um, the point on the Good Friday Agreement and Stormont, um, I, I'm on record as basically saying that uh, maybe that shouldn't be carried through, but obviously if we're going to respect the Good Friday Agreement and enshrine it or enshrine its principles um, in a new constitution, maybe there will be um a, a transitional period of um whatever uh, length now my point is and the question would be from that um my my thought is that that period should be quite limited because i honestly feel that with the bureaucracy of a dublin administration belfast administration council administrations that really would become top heavy for such a small uh, place um so therefore my thought is keep that period of for review of the existence of Stormont, uh, keep that to a minimum. Uh, on the health service, I'll, I'll try to be very quick, Colin, and then get it into a question. On the health service, I've already proposed and on record about that the National Treasury Management Agency could issue a bond to help the transitional period of building that health service for all. And then thirdly, my worry would be about strategy, Colin. There's a lot happening and it's going to, it has to be applauded. It deserves all the applause it can. But where's the coordination in the absence of a Taoiseach who isn't driving that, the, 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 the thought process here that could change with the new administration? So where's the strategy to start these citizens assemblies rolling? And is there an organization that's going to be the fulcrum of that, regardless of maybe waiting on a different Dublin administration? So the points are, can we keep Stormont, this transitional period, to a minimum? Can we sort of finance the health service uh, that we envision? And thirdly, who's the driver of the strategy that can bring together the great efforts that are being made by a diverse group or diverse groups of people. Thank you, Billy. That those are excellent questions. I'm asking the panelists just to note these down because we're going to come back to them for the reflections That's on right. a range of this to just to make sure we, we get as many people in. I see Peter Peter Doran, you've your hand up there. Would you like to uh, can we hear Peter? Thank you, Colin. Um, can I ask the uh, the panel, um, including yourself, if you feel that there is an adequate emphasis on ecology and environmental rights in the context of this uh, discussion on a new constitutional moment, um, given that we're um, just coming out of the uh, COP and the emphasis, new emphasis on climate change? Given the importance of seizing the imagination of uh, younger people in this context, shouldn't we at the very least be talking about embedding the right to a healthy environment? Is health meaningful in the absence of a healthy environment? And perhaps even going further and considering uh, embedding the rights of nature itself, the rights of the island and its ecosystems as uh, rights bearing subjects. Thanks. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. Um, just want to take, if there's anybody else out there in the audience who would like to 
ask a question before I go back to the, the panel with some of these to get their reflections. Um, just note there, there's a comment in the chat box about the Constitutional Court in South Africa, which I think goes back to issues around how transformative uh, this is all going to be. So uh, to the panelists, panelists, you can also see the chat questions there if you would like to pick up some of those in terms of uh, responding. Uh, questions from Billy there, which I think is the, the keep storming question or don't keep storming question, uh, issues around funding healthcare. And I suppose the big picture question around strategy, you know, where this seems to be stuck at the moment, how is this going to go forward? And Peter's questions around environmental rights. Um, again, I want to go back for a range of other contributions as well. So I'd ask a pa panelist to, to try and keep this uh, keep this uh, concise, more concise than I'm being. I'm going to go to John first. John, any thoughts or reflections on some of the questions you've just heard? Yes, I mean, specifically on the, on the health budget one, um, I would certainly hope that the uh, Irish government would continue its committed investment to Slauncha Care, that that would transition into the budget for a uh, new health service, the budget for the current year is in the region of 1.2 billion euros for Slauncha Care. Um, I think also that I, 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 I think the point uh, put forward by Billy about the need for a, some form of bond or additional funding to uh, manage the transition to an All-Ireland Health Service and to significantly improve on what we already have uh, is very valid as well. I would hope though also that the synergies and efficiencies that can be achieved from an All-Ireland Health Service will enable um, improvements to be made in, in the quality of that service uh, within a reasonable budget. And as I say, that budget line is there already in the Irish government's plans for the years ahead through this, the implement, uh, to fund the implementation of the Slauncha Care uh, initiative. Thank you, John. Eilish, would you like to reflect on some of the questions there around um, strategy, uh, Stormont, environmental rights? I, I want to thank people, first of all, Colin, for all their comments and their contributions. I mean, this is literally a constitutional conversation we're having at the moment. And, you know, Peter's contribution about the ecology and, if you like, the land, the environment, the ecosystem being a rights bearing constituent in the conversation is fairly new to me and I really welcome it and would welcome, as he does, the prospect of younger people um, taking up the invitation to imagine a different future in relation to environmental protections on the island, about which I know very little, I'm afraid to say. but. I would certainly encourage him and encourage others. Let's have the conversation about those issues and let's make sure that we're all better informed about what needs to be done and how a constitution might address those issues. I'm most encouraging, Colin. Um, and I'm also encouraged by the question about strategies because that's one that is a difficult question, a very challenging question. And I mean, on my part, our strategy is to engender constitutional conversations, to keep the impetus going and to spread the word and to involve as many people as possible. The strategic way forward, I think, is one that needs to be well thought through. Some people talk about a citizens assembly. Uh, my colleague Fidel Maash has investigated some citizens assemblies and found that the, the gender weight of their debates is light, to put it mildly. But I'd like to pass over to yourselves again. OK, just to reflecting back on um, like some of the questions came my way as, as chair, slightly uh, abuse my position here as chair. But the strategy question is an interesting point because everyone in this uh, conversation this afternoon will have been at endless discussions about preparation planning. And everyone seems to agree on that. But obviously, there's a slight uh, blockage and the blockage is a sense of how can this be progressed further like one of the notable things is the proliferation like all of you will be aware of the not a week goes by without a new initiative being announced by university 
or in civic society around what's happening on the island. But I think the strategy question raises an important point about coordination. You know, ultimately, if you think about it, on either side of the eventual referendum argument, people are going to have to make propositions. There's going to have to be a prospectus de developed. You know, so if there is a proposal for a new Ireland or a new constitution, how will that be achieved and how will that be taken forward and what that's going to look like? And I think a number of questioners have put a very strong focus on civil society, but there's also an important role for the Irish government as well to step into this space too. And I think at the moment there is, I suspect, a, a measure of frustration that while everyone agrees on the need for planning and preparation, uh, you know, taking this forward in a coordinated way seems to be uh, an issue right now. Ultimately, my own view to, is that, you know, we can talk about how we share the island in the here and now, if you want to use that language. But what we're essentially talking about today is, is how we all share the island in a better way in the future. And I think they're, they're all part of the same conversation. I'm going to go to my colleague, Patty Kelly, to see if Patty wants to reflect and respond to some of the points that we made in the chat box, but also that have been raised there by Peter and Billy as well. Um, I suppose building on building on on Elisha's comment um, about what our purpose is is about uh, you know engendering conversations, discussions, and 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 trying to contribute positively and move the debate and discussion on. Um, I want to pick up on Peter's uh, question around environmental rights. Yes, Peter. I mean that has been my experience. Young people are very concerned about environmental rights and about the need to to protect those. Um, uh, and I think there is a there is a, a an urgency uh, that you will know better than I do in terms of doing that. Um, and to be honest, it is not my area of expertise in terms of rights protections. But what I would say is that there is the appetite there. So if someone like yourself to go back to the theme of what we're about, if if someone like yourself or others could could have a sole focused discussion about what uh, environmental rights protections might look like um, uh, in a new constitution, um, solely focused on that uh, and uh, encourage, you know, engagement by young people across the island in that. I think that would be a very welcome and really important um, discussion um, in terms of moving moving this issue forward. Um, and I think that then speaks to, to Billy's question about strategy. I mean, whenever, whenever you were asking me, Billy, I was thinking about it. Um, from my experience in terms of rights, when we have changes in terms of rights, they haven't come from governments, they haven't come from, from uh, politicians or political parties. It's been in response to a groundswell of, of uh, uh, opinion and, and a, a, a concerted effort um, on the part of, of civil society or human rights activists or community activists. I'm, I'm putting in mind um, the Margaret Mead uh, quotation about never doubt that a small group of people can change the world. Um, uh, and I think if you look at what happened in relation to uh, equal marriage in terms of repeal the in terms of um, uh, same sex marriage uh, in the North, basically politicians and political parties and government actually followed where people led. And I think we are in that space. I think we have to lead and eventually, in my view, um, government, um, uh, the Irish government, indeed the British government will actually eventually catch up with us and realise that there's a pity, uh, tipping point where it is going to impact on their votes and their ability to be elected, etc. And will then rush to steal our clothes. I think that's a point that we need to be very careful about that in, in that they don't uh, try to steal our clothes and remodel them into something that is not what we envisaged. Um, so in terms of the strategy, I think we keep on doing it, growing it, but we protect the integrity um, of our discourse. And, you know, Peter organised an all-island discourse around how we protect environmental rights solely on that issue um, in a new constitution, you know, contributes to all that. And you'll have, you know, the Green Party North and South running to, 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 uh, to steal your clothes, uh, Peter, but be sure you, you protect them. That's a great point, Paddy. Very powerful intervention as well about really civic leadership on the island that has really led the way in many areas that we're talking about today and is doing so again. I suppose what that really highlights as well, Paddy, is the sense that we'd encourage people in this call and around this call to 
in a sense, do what we're doing is that uh, organize your own events, organize your own conversations, even organize your own groups to explore some of the issues that we are talking about today, but very much where civil society is led on this island, everyone else seems to eventually follow, but whether they follow in the same way that perhaps people in civic society would want is a, an open question. Mark, I'm going to come to you in terms of, Billy raised there the, the, the question that recurs and recurs, Mark, you'll know this from the debate is around Stormont and the institutions in the North, the assembly and the executive, you know, do they stay, do they go? What happens next, both in terms of the options, but in terms of just facilitating discussion around this, Mark, be really interested in what your thoughts about that is. Stormont, what's going to happen to it? Okay. Uh, well, I, I think one of the uh, essential features of the Good Friday Agreement was power sharing. And, and the way that's given effect in the agreement is in the devolved institutions here. And uh, there isn't power sharing in the central UK government. So power sharing, uh, I think it's important that it, it continues uh, in some form. There's a debate on whether or not the appropriate place for that is devolved institutions uh, located in Belfast, or whether there would be constitutional or le legally mandated power sharing between uh, the traditions in uh, the Irish central government. Uh, I, I think the better location for it is here. Uh, is in the north. There is going to be, uh, I mean, if it is agreed that uh, the, the assembly and the executive are to go from the, from the current uh, configuration, and if that's put to the electorates both north and south, and if, and if it's endorsed, uh, so be it. But at the moment we're working uh, from the starting position that there was a promise for the continuation of power sharing. Uh, whether it was in uh, Northern Ireland in, in the United Kingdom or a United Ireland. So unless I, I think unless something is agreed and it, it can command the same kind of widespread, widespread report, uh, support, uh, the view that, that's more consistent with the agreements, and I think the one that's more likely uh, to secure support, both North and South, is some continuation of, the, of, the, of those institutions. Uh, there was one just other uh, point I, I saw come up in the, in the chat box, and it was just about the possible trigger for, a, for the referendums. Uh, I mean, it's often said this is at the, the complete discretion of the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, that, that, that that's probably too too much of a simplification. You know, there is a legal duty uh, in international law in the Good Friday Agreement and in domestic law in the Northern Ireland Act. And th this has been examined by uh, our Court of Appeal here in the in Raymond McCord's decision from April of last year. Uh, there's a wide discretion on the Secretary of State to call such a vote. Uh, and that would, the expectation would be that there would have to be a concurrent referendum in the Republic. But there are circumstances in which a, you know, there is a legal duty on the Secretary of State uh, to call such a vote. I mean, the, the court said that what it requires is, it's an assessment, you know, it's a largely, there's a large political element to the judgment, but it involves an assessment, which involves, sorry, an evaluative judgment as to the likely outcome. So the, the Secretary of State is required to look at relevant evidence. Uh, the Secretary of State is prohibited from uh, totally ignoring evidence which you know, which would support a, a majority in favour of unification in the North. And in, in those circumstances, it has to be called and it has to be conducted with honesty and rigorous impartiality. So one of the circumstances in which, you know, if we were looking at opinion polls in this jurisdiction, which were equivalent to the kind of stuff that's been uh, seen in Scotland for the last year or two, you know, that, that is a, a strong case, and it's a strong enough case that could even perhaps be enforced by, by a court. You know, if there is uh, a majority in the Assembly, you know, that, that's another relevant uh, consideration. But if there is a long history of, of opinion polls, uh, which is showing something close to a settled position, which it looks like in Scotland, you know, that it, it can't be that the Secretary of State or the British government could hold out indefinitely. Uh, the, the, the Northern Ireland Act 
has created a duty to hold a, a vote in those circumstances. OK, Mark, I'm just going to go back out to the audience now in terms of any additional questions that anybody out there would like to raise. Just raise your hand there in terms of the uh, chat function and just the raise hand function. We've got Alan here who would like to ask a question. Alan, can we hear Alan? Hello, everyone. Uh, thank you very much for hosting this actually. It's very um, I'm just thinking of the distinction between uh, winning uh, a referendum on both sides um, and actually having a sufficient change in the constitution that is then palatable for everybody uh, living on the island. So drawing the distinction between having a shared island and just enough to win. So I'd welcome the panel's thoughts on, I suppose, how many shibboleths or how many red lines that uh, various sides currently hold should uh, be thrown away in order to make it a truly shared Ireland and a shared constitution. Thank you, Alan. That's a that's actually a great, great question in terms of just going to go to see anybody else like to make a contribution. Any other questions out there? OK, before I go back to the panel. OK, I'm going to go back with it with that question. Maybe just reflect on that one, Alan, um, for our purposes this afternoon is that some of the conversations around this seem to neglect the, re the reality that we're heading into referendum campaigns. There would be concurrent referendums on the island and that essentially people will be in those to essentially win those. So I suppose the question to the panel is about the issue of winning referendums north and south in terms of what, what might need to be uh, factored in to those discussions. I'm going to go to uh, Eilish uh, Rooney to see if Eilish wants to respond to that question around, you know, actually uh, the referendums themselves, strategy and, and winning referendums and what might need to be factored in. Eilish. Hello, Colin. Uh, just Hello. coming on board again. Uh, so thanks for the easy question. Um, <laughs> I think what we're doing at the moment in having this conversation, and I found it even listening to colleagues that I've learned a lot about how, if you like, the Good Friday Agreement offers protections and also indicates ways forward as well as making requirements on the Secretary of State, as Mark has just outlined. So the, there's an apparatus in place, Alan, for a referendum to be held. And we have experience on the island, we have experience from the Good Friday Agreement of holding a referendum and what that involves. And on the basis of a majority vote is the requirement for the referendum. And I'm fully in support of that. But I think that your question poses a challenge to all of us involved in this, um, in the campaign and in organising conversations to ensure that as many voices as possible are part of the conversation and are heard and can influence the offer, if you like, that's on the table whenever people are asked to make their decision. And don't forget as well that the proposal that I've listened to and have agreed with so far is that there should be a transition period whenever the referendum, following the referendum, and a transition period that is a serious time for people to get together and look at what's on offer and what room there is to adjust and make demands um, that are made by people who have maybe previously not had their voices heard or not entered into the negotiations that may well be required even before a referendum is held. So I, I would welcome, Alan, if you have any views yourself on this, I mean, after panellists have their say, but I would welcome your views if you have them and the views of anyone else in the room. I'd love yeah. to hear from you. And that's a great point. You know, I'm keen to hear your, your thoughts on this as well. Um, John, winning referendums. Yeah, I mean, obviously from a strictly legal um, and constitutional perspective, was, it, this is down to the sort of 50% plus one discussion which uh, that 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 is the basis on which we conduct elections here 
and referenda. Uh, but I think it's fair to say we would all aspire to doing significantly better than that um, in terms of selling the vision of a united Ireland. And I think that a number of things come into play here. I think that we've the word transformational has probably been used in all of our contributions and has appeared, I think, in the chat as well. I think we've got to set out our vision. Um, I think we've got to try to win as many people as possible over to uh, the, the progressive view, the, the, the view that uh, unity on this island is uh, very desirable, uh, offers great opportunities. I think that um, Brexit will have a big part to play in this. I mean, it's important to bear in mind that Brexit happened, when Brexit happened, it was the period of the point of maximum um, convergence between the UK and, and the EU in terms of um, policies and laws and 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 uh, the way that so, so many issues, the divergence is now going to follow. Uh, and we're seeing we're hardly into that process and we're seeing already the problems that have emerged. So I think Brexit is going to play an increasingly important part in um, encouraging uh, people to think afresh, to think of uh, new relationships, to think of the importance of membership of the EU. And I think that that combined with the transformational discussion uh, through mechanisms such as some of the ones who are listed, but Citizens Assembly, a special minister for Irish unity, I think those offer the opportunity as well to maximise support for the prospect of Irish unity based on a very um, good understanding of the advantages that will follow. Thank you, John. Pa Patty, you mentioned in your contributions the importance of civic society activism in all of this. Um, and in terms of referendum campaigns that have already happened on the island, Paddy, I wonder if you'd like to say a bit more about that in terms of the actual referendum itself. Sorry, Colin, um, I actually just spilled a glass of water, so I missed your question, but I'll give my reflections. <laughs> well, we're really thinking uh, about think winning, winning referendums, you know, and the role of civil yeah, society yeah. activism you mentioned. Sorry, it was the shock when you asked me to answer the question. <laughs> the glass of water. Um, no, sorry, apology. I mean, um, I, I, and and I think Alan's question is really important, um, and and it goes without saying that I, I agree with what with what um, other colleagues in the panel have said in terms of what the Good Friday Agreement says about about the actual referendum, the fifty percent plus one. But I think it is an important thing, and and thinking about your question, Alan, and again, I would welcome your 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 views on it. Um, it occurs to me that we have a lot to learn from Brexit, right? So, you know, we all know, and I don't need to tell anybody on this on this meeting, basically, that people voted for Brexit, Brexit without even understanding what it meant. That can't be allowed to happen again. So, as as John and others have said, we need to be very clear um, through whether it is the um, civic uh, conversations or whatever, what we're actually voting for. And that then leads me to again look at Brexit in terms of if you don't do that, you don't bottom out the red lines before it actually happens. You're in the scenario where that this actually unfolding as we speak around the British government renegotiating uh, an international uh, agreement that it signed up to and, and introducing new red lines or whatever. So I suppose my my I think I'd, I'd like to think more about it and discuss it more in detail or whatever else. But I think it's it's imperative that we bottom out those red lines before the referendum, so that there are nothing there's nothing coming down uh, the line after uh, after the referendum, um, that um, you know will delay the process further, uh, will extend any transition period, um, uh, and will. Um, uh, mitigate against a truly shared island. So I think that's the importance of these conversations. What are the red lines? What are the shared visions? Um, but they need to be done now. They need to be done before the referendum. There needs to be clarity as to what we are actually voting on. We cannot go through a Brexit Mark II in relation to this process. Um, and that's where the importance of civic society, the civic voice, the wide, the deep, the meaningful conversation with young people, with, wom with women, with older people, uh, with, uh, with our new communities, uh, etc. 
That's great, Patty. Paul has got a comment in the chat box around the role of the education processing system within schools, um, critical race theory and issues in the US. Uh, there, uh, Derek has comments around most recent referendums. And uh, Mark, t turning to you, and I'll come back to the panelists just to prepare them for final reflections, just as we draw to a close. But Mark, in terms of that issue about, we did some thought about this a, a while ago, about the North and South and the differences and the, the winning question referendums, just what's your own thoughts in terms of strategies winning referendums? Because they will, these will be referendum campaigns. Thanks, Colin. Yes, uh, I mean, the, the questions that are going to be posed in, in both jurisdictions are going to be binary. You know, you're going to be asked to either vote for partition or, or for reunification. So, you know, the, the real question that, that both electorates is, is going to be asked is, you know, is, do you choose the status quo or do you choose the United Ireland that's being offered? So those in, uh, you know, in, in terms of what red lines should be negotiable or, or should be dropped, I think the focus needs to remain on, you know, do you want partition or, or do you want a united Ireland? So the, the, the proposal on the United Ireland should be generous. It should be one that uh, those who are campaigning for it uh, are, can admire and can be proud to, to argue in, in favour of that. Whether you win or lose, this was a this was a decent and imaginative and generous offer. If, if it's rejected in, in either jurisdiction, uh, then we, we continue with the status quo. Uh, if it's accepted, then, then it, it hopefully be able to point at and say it was campaigned for and proposed uh, in good faith, and it's going to be implemented in good faith. Uh, looking on, you know, the recent kind of referendum campaigns that we looked at, uh, the you know in, in the Republic, the the repeal of the uh, Eighth Amendment, you know, had the potential to to be very divisive. Uh, maybe it was, uh, but it, it, you know, outsiders looking in, I think, admired how how it was done. Same with the uh, marriage equality referendum. Uh, for the most part, the, I thought the Scottish referendum was was conducted in, in again in an admirable way. Uh, very few people can say that uh, about the the Brexit referendum. Unfortunately, uh, it was proposed by by somebody who who didn't believe in it, and it was. It was uh, UK membership of the European Union was, was kind of advocated for in a, in a kind of weak and apologetic manner. Uh, it didn't get the same the kind of levels of turnout that, that might have been expected here, given the importance of it. And that I think a lot of people were turned off because it was being presented in terms of what's best for Britain uh, rather than what's best for for Ireland and Britain. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mark. Again, there's a range of comments which we're going to take into account uh, in our reflections on the event today, which is very much about inviting feedback, sharing some thoughts. So just by way of concluding today, this isn't the obviously end of the discussion and please feel free to reach out to us beyond today. But what I'm going to ask is for each of the speakers now just to share uh, one or two final reflections before we end today. So I'm going to go to John first to, 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 to share your final reflections on the discussion today and what you've heard. Okay, I, I'll be brief. I, I, as, as always, I've, I've been a participant or, or, or a viewer in the audience for a number of these discussions and I'm always pleased and uplifted by the, um, the thought that people put into this issue and it, it gives me a lot, of, a lot of hope that we will get through this process um, in a positive way and that we will end up, uh, as Mark was saying, looking back on the equivalent of a marriage equality referendum, referendum rather than looking back on, on, on the equivalent of a Brexit referendum, which has been quite disastrous. Um, some really relevant points in the chat to take away rather than try to answer now. I was just One has just shuffled slightly up the screen there from um, Brian, from Derek it was, I think, or Brian, sorry, it was about, uh, you know, how far you go in setting out your stall without unionists taking part in that discussion. Uh, uh, so that, that sort of um, challenge between getting as much of the facts and, 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 and options set out and, and right in advance, but not being seen to have made up 
decided the future of this country without in the absence of a significant input from the from the unionist community. So I think there are interest of, a lot of interesting thoughts to take away uh, and I look forward to doing that. Thank you. Thank you very much, John. Mark, over to you. Final reflection. Reflections. Thanks, Colin. Uh, no, enjoyed the, the opportunity to, to to hear from everyone and, and get the feedback. Uh, the one thing I, I have to uh, plead ignorance is, is the idea of a kind of ecological or environmental arguments either for partition or uh, for reunification. And it's something I'm d definitely going to have to consider because it is, uh, the, you know, the, perhaps the biggest issue of the the century ahead of us and. Uh, just just need to consider what's the best way of pitching that or what are the strengths or the, the merits of, of that type of argument. Okay, Mark, thank you very much. And uh, just to say, we're also Alan there and uh, Derek and others and many others in the chat who've raised points. Please make contact with us beyond today. This isn't a one off event. We'll be reflecting on what we've heard today in the future work that we're doing. So, Patty. Your final thoughts and reflections on today. Yeah, again, just to echo John's comment. I mean, I think it, it, I think they're really encouraged by the discussion, the appetite, the how much people have obviously been thinking about it um, and, and thought given to it. And I suppose um, uh, what struck me in that is is Derek's comments. Um, and that's sort of the experience in the South, the Shannon abolition, the marriage equality, children's rights, repeal of the eight shows the power and influence of strong civil society groups. Uh, and again, um, the, uh, and I think this is a really interesting one, Derek, um, that would be important about hosting future discussions with some of those involved in the civil civic society campaigns, marriage equality and repeal of the eight campaigns. I think that's really, really good. Um, uh, suggestion um, that maybe we need to go away and think about it. But but the underlying thing for me that I'm taking through it is, again, this part of civic society, it was there in the Good Friday Agreement in terms of getting rights protections there. Um, I think it's here now. I think we are in the driving seat. Um, I think politicians and government will eventually run to catch up with us. Um, but I think we need to keep pushing forward and and um, drive home the importance of, of having these conversations and preparing. So thank you all very much. I, I find it really interesting and, and, and giving me a lot to think about. And yes, definitely the environmental rights ones, Peter, big time. Thank you very much, Patty. Very, very strong emphasis there on civic leadership in terms of taking this forward. Again, Eilish, final thoughts and reflections from today. Thanks, Colin. Um, it's really to say thank you to the people who've joined us and made their contributions. It's really important to have these conversations, absolutely. And I'm looking forward to the day when they're not made on the internet. The internet allows us to attend meetings that we might otherwise not attend, which is fair play and it's great. But all the same, obviously there are people out there listening to this conversation that have a lot more to say and have a, a significant contribution to make in taking the conversation forward. So I would urge people who are listening, watch this space, but create your own. I've found in having constitutional conversations with women and women's groups that women from all backgrounds are more than willing to join in the conversation and basically to see what they can make of it and what they can contribute and what they want to see in the future. And those are the critical questions that will mobilise people towards a referendum, however they choose to vote. Thanks very much. Thank you, Eilish. Uh, that quote, watch this space, but create your own, I think is a, is, a, is a really, really excellent way to end the discussion today. I want to thank all our speakers and all of you for attending. I want to thank Jeglon Coyle for organising uh, this event today, making it all happen. Your feedback and engagement is really very much appreciated and we will note it and the group will take it on board and we hope to continue the discussion with all of you. We're learning lessons, all of us, as we go along and I have absolutely no doubt at all that the conversation that we're all engaged and participating in is going to continue. So thank you all again and all the very best and look forward to continuing our discussion. Thank you.